Hey, DJ Chuang here. I'm talking with Dr. Paul Metzger. He authored a book recently called Connecting Christ, How to Discuss Jesus in a World of Diverse Paths. And it's a very timely book, and I'm glad we could have a few minutes to chat about it. So tell us about yourself and what prompted you to write the book. Great. Thanks so much, DJ. It's great to be with you and with uh, those who are taking part in this conversation, watching it and the like. And uh, I'm the professor of theology and culture at Multnomah Biblical Seminary here in Portland, Oregon. It's part of Multnomah University. And this is the most recent book I've authored. Again, as you had already said, Connecting Christ, How to Discuss Jesus in a World of Diverse Paths. It came out in May of this year with Thomas Nelson. That's right. It's a great cover. I like the cover. And this book really exemplifies the interfaith dialogue that you've been a part of. And it's a rather thick book. It's uh, academic, but yet uh, easy to read. So that's a really hard balance that you um, you put together. So I commend you for that. So yeah, Thank tell you. us about the book and what kind of response have you been getting from Christians and then from non-Christians? The book is framed uh, in... Uh, the following way. I present what I call a relational incarnational approach to evangelism and apologetics. So often we think of apologetics in terms of winning the argument. And of course, we are to make sound arguments, good, thoughtful, logical arguments. Uh, and I talk about the need for worldview, uh, you know, the Christian worldview and the rational articulation of the Christian worldview. But I also say in the book that it requires more than rational articulation. People are more than their reasoning capacities. And so while we go through our reason and use reason, it has to be more than reason. So I talk about the need for relational engagement. At one point in the book, I talk about creating space with our lives for our views to be heard. I also talk about incarnational, not that we are uh, extending the ministry of Christ. It's not that we're as the church, a second incarnation, but we participate in the incarnate life of the Son of God. And through the Spirit, we participate in his life. And so relationship is more than, you know, being nice to one another. It means sharing life with people, even at great cost to ourselves. So relational, incarnational apologetics. So often there's been hostility toward the church because we haven't always been that hospitable toward others. So hospitality and neighborliness will require inconvenience and inconveniencing ourselves. And so that is so key that we create space with our lives for our views to be heard. And so that's a key part of the book. I set out at the outset of the book, the first section is dealing with uh, what is this relational incarnational apologetic? One of those apologetic aspects is making an apology. But making an apology is saying, I'm really sorry, we have blown it at times, being willing to be open, straightforward, honest, to repent, to live into a lifestyle of repentance where we really do come alongside eye to eye, heart to heart, across the table, getting beyond power brokering in our engagement. Because so often there's that cynicism toward the church, toward myself as a Christian that I often experience, in part because people have faced um, tensions, they've faced hostilities, and they've had very bad encounters with Christians. And so being willing to enter in and say, you know, I'm part of this family. Yeah, some of my Christian, quote unquote, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, even myself, we haven't always played right. We haven't always played fair. And we need to own that. So that's part of that. But the second section, I actually set forth articles on eight major religious traditions. Uh, Judaism, Islam, uh, Unitarian Universalism, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, Wiccanism or Neo-Paganism. Mormonism, atheism, etc. So eight traditions that I'm engaging, and I try and frame it by way of what I set out at the outset of the book to talk about this relational incarnational apologetics. And then I have responses from uh, key members of these various religious traditions that appears at the end of the book. It's actually the section four, the fourth section, that is at the end of the book, but they're providing responses to my articles, and I allow them to have the last word. Because I think that that's the way life is. It's it's a matter of keeping the conversation going, uh, and that we need to do apologetics and evangelism in much more of that kind of open-ended engagement. We're not about winning the battle and then losing 
the war, quote unquote, but really continuing to keep that open, build the trust, and not a bait and switch approach. I mean, whether someone comes to know Christ or not, I still want to be their friend. So often I find the cynicism uh, in the pagan community and elsewhere that they just feel that so often all we're about is seeing them convert. And that's not very relational. It's not taking into account that our God is triune and that to be triune, God is three persons in relation, not an egg white, egg shell, egg yolk, as some will talk about the Trinity, but God is three persons in communion sharing life with us. And we're inviting people to share that life and to be relational with them. And so that's, again, part of the dynamic, the DNA of the book. But then after part two, where I present my own Christian reflections on these traditions, living into the paradigm that I'm seeking to develop by way of a relational incarnational model. Then I get into some of the hot topic, hot topic issues like heaven and hell, uh, homosexuality. I get into the matter of uh, religious pluralism. Are there many paths, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are various issues that I'm addressing in the book in section three before that last section on their responses, the religious uh, leaders from these other traditions uh, and their responses. So uh, I have found the engagement very constructive. I work closely with a Zen Buddhist community in town. And so there's always interaction with them about the themes of the, the book. Even though we're not studying the book together, the Buddhist priest in that community is my Buddhist respondent to the book. And uh, We've engaged constantly. We just did an event at Powell's Books in Portland about the book and our partnership. And people could go to the New Wine uh, Facebook page, New Wine, New Wineskins, and find it there, this institute I directed at Multnomah. So there's that audio of the event at Powell's. And that gets at some of the ongoing life behind the book because we're really trying to live into it here. Uh, the community I work with, this institute, New Wine, New Wineskins, and myself personally. So... The, the Buddhist community is the group that I've worked most closely with on the values of the book and going beyond even the book, hospitality, neighborliness, uh, religious diplomacy in the best sense of that term. So I hope that helps answer some of what you were um, asking a few minutes ago, DJ. Yeah, thanks for walking us through the content of the book. I mean, you really work hard at presenting uh, other people's views fairly and with honor and respect. And at the same time, you also dig into scripture to show how we can give a reason for the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. And too often that uh, verse out of First Peter 3 gets a little bit distorted and we give too much. Well, we give way too much answer and we leave out the respect. We leave out the gentleness and we kind of run people over by our right. faith out of uh, sincere zeal. But it, the impact uh, doesn't match the intent. Right. And it, it's a challenge for myself too. this idea of, you know, zeal and wisdom that scripture talks about. And as you were alluding to uh, the passage, first Peter three fifteen, with gentleness and respect or Jesus, you know, one fourteen of John, he is grace and truth to be that combination to integrate those various dynamics. What a challenge. We need the spirit for sure. And, and the book closes with a postscript on prayer and not perfunctory prayer, but living into that state of prayer where we're really practicing the presence of God, even in our apologetic encounters. So how does this model relate to evangelism where the goal is to see someone come to Christ and to see their personal conversion? Well, I, I long to see people come to Christ and I, I want to present a winsome message, a truth filled message. Uh, I want Jesus, as I, I say in the book, to be the stumbling block, not ourselves. And uh, so Paul talks about Jesus being a stumbling block. I mean, he's foolishness, he's weakness. As Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 1, he's a scandal. I'd rather he be the scandal, um, and it takes the Spirit of God to draw people, rather than it being us who are the scandal, if you will, and ourselves being the stumbling block. And so how do we witness to him with our lives, our words? If we set up straw man arguments where we try and portray these various religious traditions in the worst possible light, or in a skewed light, how is that presenting to them a grace-filled witness? So I, I feel that we often uh, fall prey to tactics that are um, troublesome because we're so framed by trying to win and even longing to see them come to Christ. I mean, I share that burden, 
but we will often step over people to get there. And um, we really have to uh, be so zealous for wisdom in this context, zealous for wisdom, because there is so much cynicism, increasingly so in many contexts, and we've gonna, we're going to have to do the hard, heavy lifting of spending time with people and investing and also letting them know that, you know, if you don't come to Christ, I'm still going to be your friend. This is not a bait and switch. And I can't say that enough because as I've been working with pagans, you know, in the, the pagan community, capital P pagan, uh, I was struck by um, engaging them on one of their blogs where there is such hostility toward Christ because of the pain of what the church has done over the centuries toward uh, those within their tradition or traditions, and a cynicism because they feel that, and I'm not saying this is true of everyone, I, I have great rapport with uh, several leaders in the pagan community, and of course our worldviews are very different in many respects, though there are concerns for the creation and uh, the well-being of the creation, caring for the creation, I think that uh, suggests bridges, and that bridges can be formed uh, in the way that Paul was building bridges in Acts 17, but still there's this pain, there's this angst and this skepticism that all I care about is seeing them converted. And, you know, I need to let them know through my ongoing practice that I'm about the long haul for relationship. And hopefully um, that's going to give that sense of the beauty of Jesus to people. Uh, but that's up to the spirit of God to create that, uh, that sense of how beautiful, profound Jesus is. I'm a witness to it, um, but I'm no more than a witness, so to speak. It's really the Spirit of God who's going to quicken people's hearts to respond to Christ. And so uh, I hope that makes sense in terms of answering the, the question. And yet, when you asked me earlier a different question, how have people responded in the Christian community, as I've engaged uh, Mormonism uh, in uh, my work since then, there's such hostility at times between evangelical Christians and Mormons, and for a variety of reasons, uh, when I'll do blog posts, I've been surprised sometimes about how there's been this heated emotion and response from both sides. And that's not true of all evangelical Christians or Catholic Christians or Mormons, uh, depending on whom I'm talking to. But there has been pushback at times, missing the point of what I've been really trying to communicate um, on these themes. And so but I have to be long-suffering. I have to be willing to get up and re-engage, not hold it against people. And so how is my own security in Christ? Am I shaped by the love of God? Or am I shaped by having to find my identity and proving people wrong and you know, getting them to clam up so that I can keep making my point? Uh, our security in Christ is huge in terms of this kind of approach to evangelism and apologetics. So what's the one the biggest misunderstanding that Christians have of Mormons? Well, I think one of the big ones, and I talk about it in the book, and uh, I'm part of a group uh, called the Evangelical Chapter for the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy, and this is something that we're seeking to engage in our group, uh, John Moorhead uh, and others, and he's in Salt Lake City. Uh, what we try to communicate, and what I try to communicate in the book, Connecting Christ, is that Mormonism is not shaped ultimately doctrinally. Uh, it's, it's shaped more by way of uh, their narratives, their stories, their rituals, uh, experience, and the like. And I would say this generally when I engage Jews and Judaism and the like, uh, Buddhism, etc., they're often not shaped by way of doctrine. Even comparative religious analysis we have so often shaped it in the West by way of Christian doctrine. I'm a theologian by trade. I, I make my living teaching doctrine. I believe in it passionately. Paul was saying in no uncertain terms that we need to watch our life and doctrine closely, 1 Timothy 4.16. But still, a lot of groups don't see themselves ultimately doctrinally. They're, that's not what shapes them. And so when we come in um, doing the heavy lifting doctrinally and press that home without creating the relationships, without engaging the stories, the rituals, the symbols, uh, the narratives, and like, we often are two ships passing in the night. And so one of the things that has been missed in this regard is, you know, I, and not, I'm not alone in this, some of us are saying that you have to approach Mormonism um, as a subculture, uh, not as a cult group. Of course, the teachings are very different on key points 
such as on the identity of Jesus in terms of his being God from all eternity. And the language is different. The use of terms is different. I think many evangelicals are wary for those reasons because using the same language at times or similar language but meaning different things. But just on the approach, we need to approach Mormons in terms of them being a distinctive culture, subculture, with unique and different teachings at key points so that we can really engage them heart-to-heart, life-on-life. That's really key in this regard. And a lot of Christians have thought, I'm, I'm not aware of the doctrinal differences. And you can see from the article in the book, I'm very aware of, of the key differences between uh, the two traditions. But I'm saying we have to see them the way they see themselves in terms of how we engage them, or Judaism, or Buddhism, and like, rather than imposing on them our constructs in terms of how we see ourselves as a movement. So, for example, if I could just use an example, if I go up to a Mormon and say, you're part of a cult group, uh, just, I mean, how's that going to work for someone saying that? Because they're thinking, you're just attacking my uncle, you're attacking my father, and the walls go up immediately. But to talk about, you know, narratives and how they approach their their sacred stories, if you will, their experience, like, and to speak to the issues of assurance of salvation and the identity of Jesus, not to somehow corner them, but to really, in a sense, probe and be willing to be probed ourselves in terms of, okay, this view of Jesus, where does that lead in terms of assurance of salvation? But to do it openly in a spirit of inquisitiveness, not inquisition. Uh, And I think so often we move toward the inquisition rather than inquisitiveness, where we really want to learn. We take them seriously. We want to learn from them. That's hard for you. What do you mean? What do I have to learn from anyone? No, but we're all on this journey. And I I don't want to tell people, come to me to find Jesus. I say, let's go find Jesus together. And of course, I'm going to go through the Bible in that regard, but I also need to be willing to engage their narratives because that's relational. That's, that's what we're talking about here, creating space in our lives for our views, our biblical views on Jesus to be heard. That's great. Thank you for taking some time to unpack that because uh, Mormonism has become mainstream with a presidential candidate that right. is uh, prominently uh, religiously Mormon. Uh, it's also been featured on uh, Broadway as a play, Book of Mormon. And then another faith that's getting a lot of airtime, not just post 9-11, but there's a new movie out called The Innocence of Muslims. I just first heard about it today, and that's creating a little bit of a backlash. Uh, Can you comment on that movie and what is a better Christian response? Well, I I just uh, want to refer to uh, a trailer from uh, that was recently uh, posted out there and that led to a lot of these tensions in the Middle East. I'll speak to to that issue. And uh, John Moorhead and I uh, had written an article about that, about how we as Christians need to be uh, engaged by way of a winsome response to Mormons and Muslims. Uh, In this case, it was Muslims. And uh, I think that so often we frame Islam by way of the worst case scenarios. Now, uh, Christians, we could certainly be demonized by way of some of our family members through history and in the present context who have not done a very good service toward gospel witness to Christ. But I don't think we should only look at the dark side, if you will, of a given movement. We have dark spots in our tradition as well. As my Muslim uh, respondent in the book said, we need to get beyond who has the most whack jobs. And uh, what he was getting at is, who's done the most harm to one another? And he agreed with me that we need to deal with what are those theological distinctives that distinguish us, that unite us. And I want to always focus on what is the, what are the common points? Starting out first and foremost, what are those points of commonality before getting to the points of where we're different from one another? And then to focus on and give clarity of thought to those points of distinctiveness between, let's say, Islam and Christianity, but to really try and build first and foremost on the commonalities, not trying to look for the worst features in a given tradition, you know, the whack job, so to speak, but to because that can be turned on us as well, but to admit that there are a variety of traditions, a variety of groups within any given tradition, and how do we find those with whom we can build peace 
have effective dialogue, try and bring attention to these good uh, forces at work for any given religion and move forward from there. And then not allowing the culture wars to frame the discussion, the whack job, so to speak, but really what are those theological distinctives? And they are there between Christianity and Islam. Um, I work with uh, a Muslim group uh, here in Portland. It's part of the Ahmadiyya sect. Uh, the respondent in the book, uh, Connecting Christ, is the president of the, the mosque here. And it's different from the, the Shia and Sunni Muslim groups. And it's often been viewed with suspicion in places like Pakistan and the like. But uh, they, they hold to core teachings of Islam, but they have a different view on the messianic figure, namely that he's already returned. And so that distinguishes them from these other traditions. But they have a movement called Muslims for Peace, Muslims Against Terror. I was on CBN when CBN came to town to interview them. And I was saying, this is an important work. CBN thought it was an important work, Muslims Against Terror. And we need to honor those traditions. We need to honor those works. So I think that's what we need to be about, seeking to build those friendships with people of goodwill. And hopefully we're that as well. We did an event with them on the uh, following the death of Osama bin Laden, some of the Christian responses or responses from those who claim to be Christians after his death, uh, very derogatory, very um, hostile. And I think is that of the spirit of Christ as much evil as he did. And I understand the pain and the angst and what had happened in our country and elsewhere. But still, what's a Christian response, again, of grace and truth in the midst of it all. And the same Muslim group, one of their uh, leaders will be participating in our church and state conference for New Wine, New Wineskins, this institute I direct here in Portland. And it's going to be about the Mormon moment and the Muslim moment. What happens if we have a Muslim candidate down the road for president? How would evangelicals engage that? So he and I will be doing a workshop together, this Muslim leader and myself on how do we engage? Because a lot of Christians think if Islam gets a foothold here, they're going to take over the land. It's going to be Sharia law, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of phobia. Um, and we have to be attentive to the gross injustices that have occurred in the name of Christianity or in Islam or Judaism or elsewhere. And again, John Moorhead and I have written a few pieces dealing with this, including the messiness of our religious traditions. We have to own that stuff and be attentive to it, but not only it, and try and emphasize the constructive and uh, the uh, constructive points for engagement, build on common ground, look for those people of peace, and then get into those key theological distinctives where we really try and understand one another uh, from the center of our traditions. Yeah, to be realistic, uh, life here on earth, we're, we're not going to see a 100% conversion of everybody coming to Christ. Right. And so we, we do need to live uh, at peace with all peoples of all faiths uh, wherever we are and allow the uh, life of Christ and the Holy Spirit to do his work and uh, hopefully we don't get in the way but that we actually facilitate that through friendship and honor and respect and friends and so on. Absolutely and you know if you if we take to heart even the point I believe was made in Miroslav Wolf's book A Law of Christian Response that what is distinctive of Christianity at its core is enemy love that that is what distinguishes it well, if we are, and I'm so often not known for enemy love, loving my enemy, because that's what distinguishes us, supposedly. I wish that were true of me. I wish that were more true of our movement. But if that is true, what difference would that make in the case of Islam? Not that we should view Muslims as our enemies, but so often we do. How should we be loving our neighbor? Uh, and Henry Nouwen said, true community is the place where the person you least like always lives. That's not affinity, that's community. How do we get to know our Muslim neighbors? And I'm seeking to really build peace with this movement I'm a part of at New Wine, New Wineskins here in Portland to build connections to the Buddhist community, the Muslim community, to be true to our faith convictions, to bear witness to Christ in grace and truth, and then see where the conversation takes us. But these people are going to be our neighbors. Are we prepared to be their neighbors? Um, because that's going to happen. It's, it's a given. We live in a multi-faith society. It's increasingly so. We need to reframe our witness, and we have to get beyond the fear that Christian America, though I take that to be a real myth, but that Christian America is dying. And I think Christ will show up more in this context when we can't depend on power games and power politics, 
but we really have to depend on the power of the cross and to really enter into enemy love. If we do that, I think we'll see the Spirit of God shine, if you will, and shine the light on Christ all the more. But that's going to cost us. Well, thank you for that final word of encouragement. I think that really caps, recaps what you've uh, presented here in uh, Connecting Christ and how we can truly love those who are different and even those who we may consider to be enemy because they uh, have different beliefs and they don't really know Christ the way we know Christ. So thank you, Dr. Metzger. Great connecting with you. Thank you so much, DJ. It's been great to be with you, and I look forward to other opportunities to dialogue and partner with you. Great. Thank you.